subscribe to our youtube channel for in-depth interviews of india inc and press the bell icon so that you do not miss our updates Welcome to Nirmal Bang, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hiral Dadia. We have with us Virendra Chauhan, head APAC Energy Aspects, joining in. Virendra, welcome to the show, and it's a pleasure to have you and speak to you. Clearly, if you go to see, this year has been really turbulent for the global energy markets. And COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the March 2020 price crash that we saw, has mm. actually sent the crude markets into a tailspin as well. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this entire scenario? Because from March lows from the negative number, which was caused, you know, on the futures contracts, we've seen a good recovery that has come in. Mm. How do you see this entire scenario panning out for you? Yeah, I mean, it's very much a um, two-tiered uh, recovery. So you're continuing to see renewed lockdowns in the West, and therefore, you know, more and more reports of refinery closures, et cetera, in the US, in Europe. But then if you look at Asia, you look at India, you look at China, uh, oil demand is actually on a growth path again, and you can actually see this in the futures curve as well. So if you look at Brent and WTI, both of them for the next six months out are in around a 30 to 40 cent contango. You look at Dubai, and Dubai's market primarily serves Asia, that curve is in backwardation. And that's generally a sign that um, uh, demand is greater than supply in for that specific contract. Right. And, and all these events that we've seen so far, Virendra, do you think, you know, adding to it the emergence of stricter uh, sulfur contents for fuels? Now, mm. all of this have actually uh, precipitated a shakeout of the global oil industry and, you know, the transformed traditional pricing assumptions. Now, the popularity of sweet crude oil among Asian refineries is actually ratcheting upwards at a solid clip. Do you think this is something which everyone needs to focus on as well? Yeah, that's right. I think um, people tend to look at things at a global liquids level, but actually yeah. what matters for a refinery is actually the quality of the crude they're receiving. And you mentioned, yes, there's a um, uh, requirement for light sweet crudes. Um, now, if you look at where that incremental light sweet crude crude has come from over the last kind of five to ten years it's all come from the u.s now mm. um with uh what's happened in the u.s energy industry the u.s shale industry and now with a um new um administration or potentially a new administration in the u.s you know that the, the days of 2019 or that million barrels per day of year-on-year -year growth in supply from u.s are over we think and therefore that has significant implications for the various benchmarks Right. So, you know, when you talk about the quality of crude as well, clearly, are we in a situation where, you know, many heavy and extra heavy sour crudes like those found in Canada's oil science and Venezuela, they could become standard assets sooner than expected? Yeah, I think um, stranded assets is a is a tough word, but let's just say um, it is a very, very difficult environment to operate for those guys. They need to prove to the investment community because of this broader ESG mandate um, for investing in the energy sector is, um, you know, how are you decarbonizing your assets? How are you reducing the impact of your um, operations on the environment? Until they've overcome that barrier, they're simply not going to get the investment and therefore they're not going to be brought to market. But I think what we need to do when we're talking about the oil market is we need to separate out short, medium and long term dynamics. Now, mm. clearly, the short term dynamic for oil is going to be driven by this COVID-19 impact on global GDP and therefore mm. demand. Now, once you look beyond that and you we're not going to um, or I think it's a fair assumption to assume that we're not going to remain in lockdown for the next next two decades and therefore eventually global oil demand will come back and when global oil demand comes back because of the lack of investment because of the low oil price and because of this broader ESG mandate no investment is going into energy so the question then becomes is where does the supply come from whether it's a heavy barrel from oil sands or whether it's a, a sweet light sweep barrel from um, shale, they all face the same issues. No investment means rapid declines. 
demand yeah. starts picking up and then you get an inversion of supply demand and uh, the market tightens up. But that's a medium to long term story. For now, we're just navigating COVID. Right. So with this, you know, what's your assumption in terms of crude prices from here on? Because we've been hovering between the 30, 35 to 40, 45 dollars yeah. a barrel. Do you think that's going to remain a range if you have to take the next three to six months into perspective? Yeah, certainly the next three to six months, we built record inventories over the first half of 2020. It's going to take at least till the end of 21, maybe into 22. Of course, that's contingent of what happens with OPEC mm. Plus. There's a meeting coming up in around three weeks time. Um, so there's a lot of uh, question marks around that. There's question marks around Biden's um, view towards Iran and whether Iranian barrels start coming back onto the market. Mm. Of course, in the last month, we've seen Libyan production go from effectively zero to a million barrels per day. So there's a lot of moving parts right now. Uh, but and but I mean, truth be told, I think over the next um, kind of six to 12 months, we don't see oil snapping out of that 35 to $45 oil price band. Right. And, and how far are we again from that $100 for barrel mark? Do you think probably that 30 or even a $40 per barrel is the new $100 per barrel for crude? I wouldn't say 30 or 40 is a new 100, but I think um, 60 or 70 is like a sweet spot in which um, uh, you don't have too much of an impact on demand. Uh, but you you can also gen uh, oil producers can also particularly the shale producers can generate free cash flow on a sustainable basis. Now, when you start operating too much above that, um, importing uh, nations or regions such as Asia start start feeling the impact. Their currencies start weakening because their uh, fiscal deficits start blowing out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is something OPEC is very much aware of. And then there's also that view that if you do, if oil prices do go too high too quickly, then you will accelerate that transition, that broader transition, which is a long-term transition away from fossil fuels and into renewable sources of energy. So I think OPEC and a number of oil producing countries are aware that those kind of those three years that we had 2012 to 14, where oil prices were not only high, but high and stable are going to be numbered going forward. Right. And, and with this, you know, we spoke about, you already mentioned about uh, Trump and Biden, but do you think the key members of OPEC would miss Trump, if that's the case, because he's the one who actually helped OPEC along with Russia bring about a record output cut. And do you think there are worries that strains in the OPEC plus alliance could reemerge under Biden's leadership then? I mean, it's difficult to call now exactly how the, the dynamic is going to play out, because you've got to remember, mm -hmm. even though we've had a change of president from Republican to Democrat, the Senate is still controlled by um, the Re Republicans mm -hmm. and therefore um, you know, it's not going to be uh, plain sailing for Biden to implement a lot of um, um, policy or at least implement a lot of policy on a very rapid timescale. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly what we what we where we are likely to see a change is that kind of appeasement between uh, Trump and OPEC. I mean, it was very well known that Trump made calls to Putin, Trump made calls to Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia um, um, in order to control or influence or impact the oil price. I think um, you're probably not going to see that dynamic or um, play out over with with a new administration. Absolutely, because you know what's happening is everyone's talking about Biden's preference towards a multilateral diplomacy versus Trump's unilateral approach. And that's something which could actually go ahead and relax sanctions on Iran if Tehran resumes compliance with the nuclear pact. Mm -hmm. And that would actually allow Iran to boost its oil supplies. Mm -hmm. So there possibility could be a risk of Russia leaving the OPEC deal, which could actually mean a collapse of the agreement. Yeah. And this is, uh, of course, given the state of the global economy, this is uh, something that like, you know, no producer or no consumer wants at the moment. They don't. They, the last thing the global economy can take now is a surge or spike in the oil price. And uh, I think Russia in particular will be very, very conscious and they will tread prudently. And actually, you know, the um, view coming out of Russia at the moment is very much a uh, 
kind of on the opposite to what you're saying in the sense that they're saying that actually um, because a lot of their oil goes to Western Europe where demand is very, very low right now, they're actually talking about not only extending the current phase two cuts which are in place at the moment uh, beyond January 2021, they're actually talking about implementing even larger cuts. So that's a kind of sign of that they really want to see um, this period of turbulence in the global economy through rather than add more to the kind of um, the, the shocks that we've seen over the last um, 12 months. So do you think that the rise in COVID cases right now may actually force OPEC to do the unthinkable and go ahead with larger production cuts from January itself? Because this is going to be a big decision for them as well and a biggest challenge, whether cutting even more production is going to be feasible. Do you think OPEC and its members would survive such a decision? Um, I think the institution's been around for several decades, so they'll certainly stick around. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, if you were to put a gun to my head right now, I would say they're likely to extend the existing phase two cut for mm -hmm. another three months as a minimum. Uh, and remember, the phase three cut was they were supposed to reduce the um, compliance rates and therefore supply rises by two million barrels per day. On the demand side, as I mentioned, the, the kind of weakness in demand is very much focused on uh, the Western world, so North America and Europe. Um, you look at China, you look at India, you look at you know parts of um, Asia, they are um, continuing to see um, the global economy or the economy in those regions needs to continue and it's being led by infrastructure and therefore um, demand for oil is actually on a rising trend and therefore you know think about the kind of key OPEC producers if you think about where all of their oil goes it's to these um, you know uh, demand demand growth centers. Right. And then especially with regards to economies, diversification efforts with regards to OPEC member countries. Now, their budgets are somewhere linked with oil revenues. Do you think the revenues are going to fall? Because what's happening is, I, I was just reading a report by EIA, which was indicating that oil revenues for them are going to fall to, say, almost an 18-year low. What would this actually mean for oil prices and the decision for lower production? I mean, I don't think it impacts uh, every OPEC producer yeah. in the same way. So if you think about um, Saudi Arabia, for example, it's the lowest cost producer um, in the world, actually, and um, therefore it can take lower prices. But if you look at something somewhere like Iraq, you look at somewhere like Nigeria, they're certainly feeling that the impact of those lower revenues those revenues are what are driving a lot of the um, uh, projects in those countries. If that revenue is not coming, then they have two choices. They either know, need to go into the international debt markets, which you know are, are, are tentative to say the least at the moment, or they need to um, they need a higher oil price. And the way they can do that is by controlling um, the amount of supply they put into the market. So um, I think um, it's not easy to paint the whole of OPEC with the same brush and say mm -hmm. that they all have a high fiscal break-even price and therefore oil prices need to rise. Right. And then with this, what's happening is a lot of volatility right now that we saw in terms of crude prices for Indra was caused on the back of the stimulus that was expected to be announced in the US. We, ha I mean, we're pretty much close to that. There is an anticipation that even if not before the elections, after the elections, soon there would be a stimulus package that would be announced. Once it's announced, what's the impact are we expected to see? Yeah, I mean, uh, typically a lot of these stimulus packages go towards infrastructure-led projects. Infrastructure-led projects are ten typically tend to be quite energy intensive, and therefore you would expect it support to support the broader energy complex. Um, but if you think about the kind of market impacts, if you look at how energy equities have traded, for example, you've seen kind of uh, renewables and clean energy stocks at record high. I'm talking equity stocks here rather than oil inventories. And uh, energy stocks such as uh, your 
exploration and production companies or your oil service companies um, continue to hit record lows. And therefore, if you think about it, um, a lot of the kind of Biden, Trump, fossil fuel versus clean energy, climate change theme has already been priced into the market. So um, I wouldn't envisage a large impact on um, oil prices from these kind of uh, stimulus packages. Right. So going ahead, what are the events, according to you, that we should be watching out for in order to track the movement in terms of crude prices? Yeah, I think probably the most important driver is coming up in three weeks time, and that's the signaling and the intention uh, from OPEC and OPEC plus. And um, after that is the uh, kind of uh, what happens with the uh, COVID situation, what happens with lockdowns, the severity of second waves and its impl implications for global oil demand. Right. And overall, with the kind of movement that we've seen on the dollar as well, uh, do you think that's something which could continue to have a major implication in terms of crude prices? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there is uh, historically uh, strong inverse correlations between uh, the dollar and the oil price. So, yeah, keeping an eye on the uh, uh, dollar index is certainly something that, um, yeah, the market should be monitoring. So, you know, when we talk about a range over the next three to six months, mm -hmm. by when do you see crude retracing those $60 per barrel mark? I think that's going to be a 2022 story. And again, that's going to be very much a second half of 21. Where are we in terms of the uh, vaccine? What's the take up of the vaccine? Mm -hmm. What's the uh, response to the vaccine? And then how quickly and how um broadly that get that the vaccine gets taken up and um uh how how, how does jet demand fare is are people going to be flying again how many flights are they taking because if anything um what the last kind of nine months have shown in many many countries is that a lot of people can continue to work from home a lot of people can continue to service their clients from the comforts of their desks and therefore they don't need to take a flight from singapore to the us or from uh, london to to india or wherever it may be so um yeah that i think they're, they're the key like drivers or that's what we're certainly tracking or looking for Right. And overall, if someone has to look at trade in terms of crude, any strategies, anything that you would want to recommend? Um, I mean, I think keep an eye on the uh, prompt uh, Brent spread. Um, mm. At the moment, I said, as I mentioned, uh, we're trading, what, um, 30 to 40 cents can tango six months out. But um, we, uh, I think, um, you know, keep an eye on Chinese buying because when mm -hmm. Chinese buy, it has an impact on the Brent curve. And when the Brent, the Brent curve can flip um, very, very quickly from this kind of uh, contango levels where it's um, kind of supportive for storing mm -hmm. crude. And then you see a discharge of that crude and then you can see um, the flat price follow uh, that movement in the prompt curve very, very quickly. So um, they're the things I think watch Chinese buying, which has slowed. Uh, we saw the trade data that come out this morning showed that there was a contraction or a, a sharp slowdown in October buying from the Chinese. Um, uh, that, that will be a key driver of various uh, crude curves and prompt spreads and physical differentials. And that will eventually feed through into the uh, uh, flat price. Right. And are you expecting oil storage becoming a concern? Um, I wouldn't have thought so because we're in a situation where, you know, OPEC, OPEC plus, if you think about OPEC produces around 30 million barrels per day of crude. Russia itself produces 10. So we're talking more than 50 percent of uh, global oil production is under mm -hmm. some form of um, or more than 50 percent is under containment. Now, if they all decide that we're going to, you know, move back into this uh, oil, oil oil price war territory and they start raising production, um, then you know there would be questions around uh, storage but i wouldn't i wouldn't envisage a track down back into negative prices like we saw in april um uh, again right and overall anything else that you would want to add Marindra, in terms of food as to what we should be uh, watching out for because we've spoken about 
what the OPEC is expected to do. Secondly, we've spoken about what impact it could have with regards to where uh, further lockdowns is concerned on production cuts or even in terms of supply. But overall, if you have to see uh, the entire scenario over the next, say, 12 to 18 months into consideration, uh, short term, yes, we know what's happening. Longer term, then how do you see it flowing? Yeah, I think uh, there's one thing that we haven't really focused on, and that's been the biggest focus of the, the, the global energy landscape over the last uh, decade, and that's U.S. shale. Um, I think the market or the assumptions going around at the moment is that uh, shale production has peaked. Uh, 2019 was the highest U.S. oil production that we're ever likely to see mm. now going forward. So what it would be interesting to see over the next 12 to 18 months is uh, how U.S. producers respond in a rising oil price environment, how investors, whether it's debt markets, equity markets or private equity, um, what their appetite is to put capital back into the U.S. space. Because a lot of people often talk about the correlation between oil price mm -hmm. and uh, U.S. shale production, but I think what is more likely or what is a stronger correlation is um, that correlation between uh, investment or capex i.e how much of these producers spending um, because if they can get the money whether it's from equity markets or elsewhere then they will continue spending and therefore activity levels go up and therefore production goes up so i think that's a uh, key kind of barometer to to measure over the next 12 to 18 months right so so how long do you think we will take or us will take to get back to those 13 million dollars uh the 13 million barrels uh, per day kind of production because yeah. from there we've started inching lower how long how far are we to get to that record number yeah i think it's going to be a uh, medium term story so we're talking you know depending on how how oil prices trade um to, uh, 20 2022 23 or even 24 story um because the, the reason for that is um base decline rates in uh, us shale production are very very high so once you're when you're producing at 5 million barrels per day if you fall to 4 million barrels per day it's not too difficult to get back up to 5 but when you're producing 12 13 million barrels per day mm. if your base if your like your vintages decline at anywhere between 50 and 70 percent uh, and what we mean by that is production at the start of the year if you measure production at the end of the year versus measure production at the start of the year you're down by 70 percent so it's called a red queen effect where you need to drill harder and harder just to stand still and that's the kind of effect you're seeing at the moment so it's going to take sustained increases in capital in activity and higher oil prices in order to kind of revisit those those days and in fact, November itself, the expectation was that U.S. Uh, production is going to dip because we did do almost a 10 to 11 million barrels per day kind of a number in October. If mm. it continues to fall in November, what's the lowest we could see according to you? Um, I mean, uh, I think we've got production going uh, below 10 million barrels per day. But um, yeah, mm. I think... Um, uh, what we shouldn't do is pay too much attention to one month's data point because there is a lot of distortions in uh, U.S. production at the moment. We had significant impacts from the Gulf of Mexico uh, hurricanes, uh, which were impacting. We had some economic shut-ins. And so what you need to do is let all of those temporary outages normalize and then uh, analyze or study the trends. Right. And very lastly, Virendra, if you talk to a lot of hedge funds, they've been increasing their bullish bets on crude futures from October going up to April. Uh, what is it that they're considering? It's mainly, do you think, uh, production cuts that could be extended by OPEC or is there something else that they've been taking into consideration as well? Yeah, I think the, the short term drivers are very much um, uh, that su supply uh, versus uh, demand story. Um, and that's what's driving a lot of that kind of fast money. Yeah. Right. And hoping that, you know, demand increases as well, because the moment the demand increases, you're seeing reopenings that are happening across economies. Uh, thank you, Virendra, so much for joining us on the show. In fact, 
Uh, there's one question coming in from one of the viewers. I hope you don't mind taking it. It's, it's basically, uh, how do you see OPEC calibrating its output given the pressure and demand and higher output from Libya of around 1 million barrels per day? Yeah, I think uh, that Libya is does certainly um, complicate um, some of the discussions um, uh, when uh, OPEC and OPEC Plus meet in a few weeks, uh, because of course, even though Libya might be exempt from any uh, cuts in production, um, of course, that's a new, a new source of supply coming into an already oversupplied market. And then of course, um, OPEC is looking to be proactive rather than reactive. So they need to keep an eye on you know, Iran, uh, the speed at which Iran comes back, and then uh, how um, um, you know what 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 um, how various politi political um, things play out between the Biden in administration and uh, OPEC, and whether Iran moves back into the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, um, and essentially we go back to an Obama type arrangement versus the arrangement that we had over the last four years with with Iran, because I think. A combination of Venezuela and Iran, we've taken offline as a result of sanctions, three million barrels per day of production um, in total, and they've been like heavy, heavy sour type barrels. Right. And uh, secondly, with regards to electric vehicles uh, picking up, what's the impact of electric CNG, LNG, auto fuel on oil demand if you have to take the next three years or even the next decade into consideration? Mm. Yeah, I'd say over the kind of next decade, you would expect it to have an impact on demand. But as far as um, the kind of next uh, 12, 24 or 36 months is concerned, I don't see the electric vehicle story impacting uh, oil production uh, or impacting oil demand too heavily just because you got to remember that the, the the global car fleet is still mm. dominated by the internal combustion engine and mm. electric vehicles impact at the margin and mm. of course that that margin gets wider and what wider over the medium to long term but over mm. the short term we don't expect that to be a driver absolutely and that's something which is going to be looked forward to as well. Thank you, Virindra, so much for joining us on the show. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Great insights. And I hope you enjoyed the conversation as well. And hoping to see you back again once we have the OPEC meet and once they decide what is to be done to understand how crude is expected to perform. Uh, stay safe and wish you a happy Diwali in advance as well. Happy Diwali. Thank you. Thank uh...